This video will be on section 7.1, piecewise defined functions. So the first section will just look at what a piecewise function looks like and how to evaluate one. Then we will look at how to graph piecewise functions. And to go along with that afterwards, if we're given a graph of a piecewise function, what is the equation? Now, because the only types of functions we've learned how to graph so far are lines, all of these are going to be lines. It's really going to be more practice graphing lines. But there is a little added thing to deal with because it's a piecewise function. All right, so what is a piecewise function? A piecewise defined function is a function that has different formulas for different input values. You know, that's kind of the way we can think about it. And so I just like to start by looking at an example of what one looks like and how to evaluate it. So this is what a piecewise function is. It says, given q of x equals this, you'll see this huge, people call them curly brackets. Um, and then the first line says negative x minus eight. And what, and then we have like a separation here and then another part going on over here. What the left side is, this is the function formula. And on the right side is its corresponding domain. All right, so just to explain what this means with the first example, and then I'll only use words to explain the other two, negative x minus eight corresponds to the domain x is less than four. So what this is gonna mean is if we need to plug in an x value that's less than four, we plug it into this formula x minus eight. negative x minus eight, the formula goes to. But similarly, the second one here says two x squared minus two x plus five for four is less than or equal to x is less than six. What this means is we, if we have to plug in a number that's between four and six, remember that when we have double inequalities like this, this means between um, and including four, then we would plug it into the second one. So we use this one for numbers for x values between four and six, including four. Note here that the one above is just less than four. So when we have to plug in four, which you'll actually see in the first example here, we'll have to plug it into the second one. And then the last one, 4x plus 7 corresponds to x greater than or equal to 6. This means we use this one for x values bigger than 6. And since we have the equal part, including 6. All right, so I just got a few examples here. Um, the first one, q of 4. Since it is a function, you have to remember that you can only get one number out, which means you can only ever plug it into one number or one formula. We would not plug in 4 into multiple formulas. Never more than one. All right, so q of 4, as I kind of mentioned above, q of 4, 4 is in the middle domain. So we want to plug it into the second equation because 4 is where that fits. But once you've identified that, then you just plug it in, and it's like our regular function stuff. We got 2, x is 4 squared minus 2 times x is 4 plus 5. 
Now we do the 4 squared, which is 16. So we got 2 times 16 minus 2 times 4 is 8 plus 5. 2 times 16 is 32. And then minus negative 8 plus 5 is negative 3. And finally, 32 times 3 is 29. So Q of 4 equals 29. If you plug in 4 into either of the other ones, it would give, give you a different number, and they're both wrong. You can only, you'll only get it correct if you plug it into the correct one. So the second one, negative 6. Negative 6 is less than 4, which means we'll plug it into the top. Um, another thing I, I want to mention, I always forget, but sometimes people will plug in the numbers into all of them and then see which one works. That doesn't matter. You figure out which one to plug it in at the beginning. So this one we plug it into the top since the x value negative 6 is less than 4. We got negative x is negative 6 minus 8. Negative negative 6 is positive 6. 6 minus 8 is negative 2. So for this one, q of negative 6 equals negative 2. And then the last one here, they're not all like this. I just have one where we plug into each. But, um, you know, just to talk about the uh, separating point kind of q of 6 where does six belong? Six belongs here in the last one because six is in greater than or equal to six. We can only plug in six into the last one or the bottom one. So six is greater than or equal to six. The x value fits in here only. It doesn't fit in here because six is not included in the middle one. All right, so we plug in 6. We got 4 times 6 plus 7. 4 times 6 is 24. 24 plus 7 equals 31. And that is how we deal with piecewise functions. But, you know, kind of to summarize it, you figure out which one you plug into first and then plug it into that one. That's why I wrote these things at the beginning. And so we figure out which formula to use first and plug it into that one. Don't try to do it another way. That's where mistakes happen. All right, so how to graph piecewise functions. Once again, since we've only really dealt with lines, all our graphs are going to be lines. Um, and piecewise functions, you'll see when we graph it, the reason it's called piecewise is there's it's just going to look like there's different pieces of the graph. All right, so to graph a piecewise function, the idea is to separate the graph according to your domain, which we'll talk about in this example here, and graph the corresponding part. And then... Like I mentioned already, since we only have learned to graph lines, all the questions will be graphing lines. All right, so what do I mean by according to your domain, separate the graph? Well, here, let's not even worry about the formulas yet. Here, our first domain is x is less than or equal to negative 4. So that means when we graph this, we're going to stop at negative 4 for this one. So what I like to do is, where x is negative 4, just draw a vertical dashed line at our stopping point. You're not going to actually do this on the graph, um, but it's a, just a good way to visualize it. What we're going to see is it's going to break apart. And then our second graph, we only graph this one between negative 4, which is where the, our other one stops, and 1. So we also stop at 1 as well. And I'm going to do the same thing. And just draw a vertical dashed line to visualize it myself. Right, 
to adjust that. They add a note. Don't look at these vertical dashed lines in the notes and think you're going to draw them in. The homework. All right, and then you'll see the last one goes x is greater than or equal to 1, which means it's going to go right forever. Right. So there are two vertical dashed lines break up our graph into three areas. You'll notice we have three formulas. That should always be what happens. Uh, the one on the top is for the left. So we're going to graph it over here. The one in the middle is where, where we're between negative 4 and 1. So I'm just color coding, and that one's going to go inside there. And then the one on the right corresponds to the one on the bottom. x is greater than or equal to 1, so it's going to be graphed over here. Now, the way we read this, we just have a formula over here. It's like graphing y equals this formula. So the left one, we want to graph y equals 0. Now, one thing you, you, know, you kind of want to think back to when we graph lines, when we have y equals a number, it's a horizontal line. So this one is just a horizontal line at x equals 0. And since you are starting, or you're going to stop here at negative 4, what you want to do is graph or plug in at your stopping point. Oops, at y equals 0. Right, so what I mean by that is we're going to stop this horizontal line that's on the x-axis at 4. And then it's going to go to the left. So what you want to do is just pick any other point to plot to the left. That's on the correct line. What it will do is it will fill out the line for you, and it will make an arrow. All right, what you have to do, since this one it goes all the way one way forever, but not the other because it stops here, what you have to make sure you do is select the graphing tool that looks like this. It looks like a one-sided line because it's only going one way. Right. And then the last thing for each section, you're going to either have open or closed circles. Since we're including negative 4 on this part, we have to use a closed circle. Right, if this was just equal then or just less than no equal then there would be an open circle okay now as odd as it is you it might you might think that the middle part would be the hardest to graph but it's all the easiest to graph because you just plot the two you plug in the two n values for x and get the y values so from the middle part What we want to do is plug in the two x values on the left and right, and then plot those points. All right, so what I mean by that, this is the x values here are negative 4 and 1.
and we plug it into our corresponding formula. If we plug in negative 4 to 0.5x plus 1, Negative 4 times 0 0.5, that's 1 half, so this is negative 2. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. So we have a point here when x is negative 4, y is negative 1. I'm just plotting this point here. I'm not indicating whether it's an open or closed circle. And then when we plug in x equals 1, we got y equals 0 0.5 times 1 plus 1. 0 0.5 times 1 is 0 0.5, plus 1 is 1.5. So it's at 1 and a half. And when you have to use do like a half, it'll let you pick it right in between. So when x is 1, y is 1 and a half. So we plot the two endpoints, and then it'll connect them in a line. The one thing you have to do here to make sure it makes the line correct is choose the tool that looks like this. It looks like just the line segment. It has double endpoints. So it's not a one-sided line, it's not a two-sided line that would go forever. It ends, it's a, kind of like a zero-sided line. It ends at each side. Right. And then the last thing, like with the other one, is whether we use open or closed circles at our breaking points or our stopping points. This one we use open circles on both because we're neither including negative 4 or 1. Neither has an equal part. So open circle for both because each of these does not have an equal part. So you'll make the graph, and then after you make the graph, then you will choose open or closed circles. All right, and then the last one, the one on the right. On the one on the right, we have y equals 3 which is another horizontal line. It's starting at one, that's where its breaking point is. And then we're just moving right forever. So then we wanna plot that point that I already indicated at y equals 3 and x equals 1. So like I did over here uh, with the one on the left, it's the same way. I just want to make sure I plot any other point that's at y equals 3 to the right, since so we want to go right forever, you have to choose the tool with the one-sided line again. All right, so the graphing tools on this section, they'll have like a line with double arrow, which will be going left and right forever. We'll have the one-sided line, which means it's just going one way forever. And then we'll, they'll have the one like the middle where it's it ends on both sides, the line segment. Right. So after you do that, then you're almost done. The last point is, do we use an open or closed circle? And we're going to use a closed circle because we've got to include at x equals 1. And that would be the graph. Now, one, one thing I'll mention here is, you know, the problems can vary. 
um, quite a bit. You know, they don't have to be two horizontal lines. There might not be any horizontal lines and you'll just plug in. Uh, let's, you know, let's say this one in the middle was actually at the bottom here. Then you would plug in X equals one and then you would plug in something else. One thing I would recommend is if you do see a decimal in one of them, unless if it's stuck in the middle, like it is here where you have to plug in the two endpoints, you want to make sure you plug in a number to make it easy on yourself, plug in a number that gives you a whole number. You know, this one I did intentionally in the video because it's unavoidable. We have to plug in one. When we get one, we get 1 1.5, but you'll be able to plot that if you need to. If it was over here, I would want to plug in a number that makes a whole number when I plug it in. But I also recommend if you do have trouble, you know, with this graphing um, part, this usually is one of the more challenging questions, just the way you have to answer it in the whole class. Make sure you hit that, um, ask me a question on the bottom, especially if you think you have the right answer. Because what will often happen is your graph will look correct. I've seen this many times. It's just missing like an open or a closed circle somewhere and you're not getting full credit, but it won't tell you what's wrong. So if you're not sure, just click that button. All right, the last one, I find this one a little more challenging just from the aspect of coming up with the equation. But since you don't have to deal with the actual graphing part, in some ways, it's a little bit easier. So what we have here is we have three little sections, little line segments, and then we want to figure out the function. And they have it set up for you. You don't have to try to type in all this stuff. The way um, we're going to fill this out is just from before, we're going to put the function formulas on the left and the corresponding domains on the right. And I like to just go in order so I don't actually skip around. The, the top one here, I'm going to do the one on the left. I'll just color code it like we did with the other ones. Then I'll do the one in the middle. Right here. And then we'll do the one on the right. On the bottom. And it's just best to go in order. That way you don't actually skip anything. You may or accidentally use a formula with the incorrect domain. Right. But at the end of the day, this is finding equations of lines, which you know how to do. So let's do the left one first. Remember that they're all lines, so we're going to use y equals mx plus b and y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, because they are all lines. All right, so the one on the left, remember to get the lines first. thing to do is to find the slope. All right, so the one on the left, actually let me not use pink because I highlighted that with the middle graph. The, one, the line on the left, we want to find the slope. And this point here at the end, it doesn't matter which two you pick, but like always, I like to use uh, ones that are at grid marks because you don't necessarily know if you're halfway in between. So this first one here, I've got x is negative 1 and y is negative 5. And then we have another point over here x is negative 3, y is negative 4. All right, so let's go ahead and plug in. The slope is y2, negative 4, minus y1, which is negative 5, over x2, negative 3, minus x1, which is negative 1. All the double minuses become pluses. 
negative 4 plus 5 is 1. And then negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. And just try a little simpler because I don't like having negative signs in the bottom. Negative 1 half. Right, so that was the first step when we found equations of lines before is we would get the slope and then we would plug into point slope form. We got y minus y1. I'm going to use this point here, negative 5 equals m, which we got as negative 1 half, times x minus x1, which is negative 1. Now you must do this and solve for y because of the way we have to type in the answer. So I'm going to first change all the double negatives to plus. We get y plus 5 equals negative one half times x plus one. And I got us trying to avoid using the other colors here. So we did distribute the minus one half through. Yeah, y plus five equals negative one half x minus one half. And then we subtract the five on each side. solve for y and we get y equals negative one half x minus one half minus five we've done this quite a few times now we get a common denominator by multiplying the five by two over two so that's ten over two All right, 5 times 2 is 10 over the 2. And negative 1 half times, or minus 10 over 2, would be minus 11 over 2. Right. Now what we fill out, this is the equation of the left line. You don't include the y equals part, you just include the formula. But you have to make it y equals. Okay, so what goes here in the formula part is the negative one half x minus 11 halves. And the domain, uh, since I kind of covered this, I'm gonna just erase this real quick. You can see the domain of this little section we have filled in circles. So the way you're gonna type it in, we have x, is between, use inequality notation here. It doesn't like interval notation for this. We start at negative six, and it's between negative six and negative one. And they're both filled in circles, so we have equal portion, equal parts for each. So they're both filled in circles. Right. Now, this one was actually going to be the hard one because whenever the slope is a fraction, there's always fractions to deal with. The other two aren't so bad. The middle one should be very straightforward if we remember that horizontal lines have equations y equals, and this hits negative, this is at negative 6. So actually, this is just y equals negative 6. You don't have any work to do there because it's a horizontal line. And then the domain x is between negative 1 and 3. Negative 1 is an open circle at this portion, so we're not going to include it. And 3 is a closed circle, so we do have to include that. All right, and then finally, the last one, the one on the right, 
we want to figure out that line and it's not a horizontal line so we've got to do some work here find two points that it passes through um, so here we have three comma negative seven And then both actually the endpoints are both filled in are actually grid marks where they are whole numbers. So I'm going to use them both. Six comma negative one is the other one. All right, and we want to get the slope. M equals y two minus y one over x two minus x one doesn't matter which one, I just like to usually make the uh, higher one be where y2 is, but it doesn't matter. y2 is negative 1 minus y1 is negative 7 over x2 is 6 minus x1 is 3. Then we add or change the double minus to a plus to simplify the slope. Negative 1 plus 7 is 6, and 6 minus 3 is 3, and 6 divided by 3 is 2. So that simplifies to 2, the slope. Now we take our slope and plug it into point slope form. Okay, so we got y minus y1, y1 is negative 7, equals m2 times x minus x1, which is 3. Change the double minus to a plus, like we always do. And go ahead and distribute that 2 through. We got y plus 7 equals 2 times x minus 6 and okay, no fractions much quicker subtract the 7 from each side to get y equals and we got y equals 2x negative 6 minus 7 is negative 13. once we got y equals this is the formula we're going to plug in 2x minus 13 is our formula and then the domain on the right, it starts at x equals 3 and ends at x equals 6. And we do not include 3, so we keep it like that. We do include 6, so we got to make it an equal part. So it's one thing that's going to be very important. You might do all this right, hit your answer, and see that the domains are wrong because you're using interval notation, which is more common to use. But when we write the domains of piecewise functions, it's just common to write them as their inequality notation. All right, but that is piecewise functions. One thing I don't want to undersell at all, the two things here in the section that are the big takeaways, one, when you have a piecewise function, you only plug your number into one formula. You never plug it into more than one. The second one is that whenever you have a graph of pieces like this, it is a piecewise function. All right, that's just something that kind of throw in the back of your head because after this class, you might not see them for a while. But piecewise functions are called that because the graphs look like pieces.